Thank you all. If you're having difficulty seeing this, the URL is up there. You can follow along online. And uh, my email address is up there as well. Always appreciate feedback. So what I want to talk about is how looking at things that aren't there can tell us a lot about ourselves. Looking at what's missing can give us as much information as looking at what's present. So once upon a time, which is how all good stories start, I was the support programmer at the University of Edinburgh Physics Department. My job was to take whatever code the physicists had built up over the course of years, sometimes decades, and make it run a zillion times faster on the supercomputer. Not the happiest years of my life. And there was the day when a faculty member, a new hire, came in with his 100,000 lines of Fortran in one file that represented 10 years of his life. Please, can you make this go faster? And I opened up the file in Emacs, not VI, because we're civilized people, and I looked at it, <laughs> right? I looked at it, and I felt this tremendous sense of relief because at least there were functions. It was not one 100,000 line block of Fortran, okay? Sense of relief lasts about a an hour, which is how long it took me to realize that all the functions in the bottom of the file were the bits of code he was no longer using. His simulation was the top half of his file. Every time he wanted to make a change, he'd take a chunk out, stick it in the bottom of the file in a function with a meaningful name because he'd been told that was important, and then just not call the function. And this is when I realized that a lot of smart people were stumbling because nobody had ever taught them a few basic skills. Right? He had no idea that version control existed. He was way smarter than I was, but there was this gap in his knowledge. And for those of you who are familiar with the Software Carpentry Project, which Brent Gordon and I co-founded in 1998, it exists to fill that gap. We teach scientists and engineers and now librarians and medical researchers and people in digital humanities, all those things that have worked so well for so long that people who think of themselves as professional programmers have forgotten that there's something there to learn. We, f we fill in all that boring basic stuff that makes a big difference. That was my first encounter with this notion that there are holes and that looking those holes tells us a lot about who we are. Second encounter was when I was the book review editor for Dr. Dobbs' journal. I had literally hundreds of books arriving every year. And this is the late 90s. The number of books on Java that just recycled the same examples from the standard Java documentation would probably fill the front of this room to waist height. There were books on compilers. There are hundreds of textbooks on compilers on Amazon on sale today, still in print. There have only, so far as I've been able to tell, ever been three books written on how you implement a debugger. Now think about that. Hundreds of books on how to compile, three on how to implement a debugger, none of them any use. Okay. What does that tell us about our profession and how we view tool use? In this case, I understand why. There is a rich theory behind the translation from languages to automata. You can do multicolored algebra with pens on a whiteboard, and that's intellectually respectable. There is no grand theory of debuggers, so it's a second-class thing within academia. Build tools, package managers. Let me just ask, show of hands, how many of you did a computer science degree? Okay. How many of you had a course on debugging? Yeah. How many of you feel that you spend, oh, no more than 30 minutes a week debugging? Right. Do you see the problem here? So, more time passes. University of Toronto asked me to teach a course on software architecture. Okay, I thought, this will be fun. I've been programming for 20 odd years. I've helped build some fairly large systems. Two dozen books later, I had seen probably a couple of thousand pages on why it's important to have an architecture, how to elicit architectural requirements, how to engage architectural stakeholders, UML, more UML, still more UML, variations on UML. In those two dozen books, there was a grand total of 10 pages describing the architectures of actual software systems. Now, imagine yourself doing an undergraduate degree in architecture. We're gonna tell you the blueprints are really important. We're gonna tell you who you should talk to when you're drawing your blueprints. We're not actually gonna show you any buildings. And then we're going to be surprised when you graduate and you can't do stuff. Okay. And for those of you who've run into them, I was annoyed enough at this that I went off and twisted some arms and got some people to contribute to a series of books. The first was Beautiful Code. Just tell me about the most beautiful piece of software you've ever seen. 
And then we did a series of four called the Architecture of Open Source Applications. Fair warning for those of you planning to stick around for the entire talk. Those books were all launched at PyCons. So, let's keep going. I bailed out of academia for the third and final time in 2010, started teaching software carpentry full time, and in about 2011, realized that I really didn't know as much as I thought I did. Uh, in particular, I didn't know as much about teaching as I thought I did, and I'd been doing it for 20 odd years. So I went and I started reading, and I found that we know as much about teaching and learning as we do about public health. Every year there are, literally, tens of thousands of top-notch studies published of how people learn, how best to teach them, the factors that influence education. And that stuff is as solidly grounded as the germ theory of disease or the correlation between smoking and cancer. And yet, most university faculty have never actually been taught how to teach. They've never been taught how to apply any of those ideas in classrooms like this. In almost every case, university faculty seem to feel that if they've sat through enough lectures, they know how to teach, which is rather like saying that I've been on a lot of plane flights, therefore I'm a qualified pilot, right? And the crash rate is about the same, okay? And, and this started to puzzle me because faculty spend half of their time or more teaching. And you will find no shortage of university faculty who wish that the general public would pay attention to research. We know this about climate change. We know this about drug-resistant diseases, about the effect of video game violence on antisocial behavior in teenage males. We know a ton of stuff. Why aren't people listening to the evidence? Well, that's a very good point, Professor XYZ. Here's some evidence about education. La, 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 I can't hear you, right? It's not just university faculty. How many of you are involved in some sort of grassroots get into coding effort? Pi ladies, Django girls, girl development. Okay, these are great. I love these. And most programmers have never been taught how to teach either. They are out there trying to educate the next generation, trying to make all this wonderful stuff we do accessible to everyone, and they're treating it the same way my 17-year-old self-treated programming languages. Gosh, I've learned Pascal. Designing a programming language doesn't look that hard. Let me start typing. We don't need to reinvent these wheels. And again, what I see is that it's just not part of the culture. There's a gap there. We don't seem to think that teaching is a teachable thing. Right. Hold these thoughts. As I've said more than once, and there are people in the room who are already nodding because you've heard the punchline, it shouldn't be called computer science. In many cases, it should be called computer strong opinion. Right? Because if you take a look at most of the debates online and within academia about development practices and programming languages, you would come away believing that two beer and a loud voice is proof, right? We, we know a ton about how software is actually built. Just, just an enormous amount. And much of what we know we've discovered in the last 15 years because we can finally get at the raw material. How many of you have a GitHub account? Thank you for putting your work up where I can analyze it. I'm quite serious. I now have insight into what you do and how you do it that was simply impossible without heroic effort prior to about the year 2000. You know, SourceForge's day has come and gone, but that one website caused a revolution whose effects still haven't trickled down into the classroom. Because here's the thing. If you want a biology program to be accredited at the university level in Canada, your students have to average six hours a week or more doing labs, real labs, the kind with you know, squishy things and electrodes and stuff, right? Most computer science students in Canada do one experiment in four years. Right? And they do that one pretty badly. The experimental method, the notion of science, isn't part of undergraduate education in computer science. So our students 
aren't exposed to the best method we have for finding and validating truth. Go and try it out. Run an experiment, collect some data, check it against your model, argue over the evidence. I'll give you one quick example of this. Hands up if you know the work of Andreas Stefik. Bloody hell. Okay, I will be adding a link at the end of this talk. Let me tell you what Andreas did. Andreas has been trying to design a language, a programming language that will be accessible to the visually impaired. Except he actually has a background in science, so he said, let's do this properly. First thing we need is a baseline case. So back in 2010, he and his students went off and did a case control double blind experiment in order to compare the learnability of the syntaxes of three different languages. Perl, which is what they used as a first year teaching language where he was, Quorum, which is the language he's designing, and Randomo, a placebo, which is a language with a randomly designed syntax. They stayed up late one Saturday night rolling Dungeons and Dragons dice to pick the ASCII tokens to make up the language. <laughs> Guess what? It turns out that Perl is as hard for novices to learn as a language with a randomly designed syntax. It gets better. That result was posted online in 2011, and as you might expect, uh, the result was a lot of angry hate mail. How dare you? Your results are not statistically significant. To which Stefik replies, here's my data, here's my analysis, here's my p-value, clearly you don't understand statistics. They went back and they repeated the study. More subjects and six languages. Perl, Java, Python, Ruby, Quorum, which is the one they're designing, and no feature goes into Quorum without A-B testing, and the randomly designed language. Guess what? It looks like languages in the C family are all as hard to learn as a random language. Python and Ruby do almost a full standard deviation better, and Quorum, which is being designed with human factors in mind and careful testing, is almost another full standard deviation better again. That means we could cut the learning time for languages for novices significantly by testing the bloody features before we put them into the language. Hands up if you took part in any of the tests that were done of the new features that were put into Python 3. Did anybody take part in those tests? The user tests of those features. Okay, so here is a medication. I want you to start taking this every single day, but it's never been tested on human subjects. Trust me, it'll make your life better. What is your reaction, please? It, no, okay. Here is many years of community effort to build Python 3 and then persuade people to adopt it. And I'm not saying it's worse than Python 2, but we don't actually know that it's better. Okay? We can do these studies, but it's not part of our culture, it's missing. And if you wanna view into the state of the art, Making Software published in 2010 is a greatest hits collection. What do we actually know from empirical studies of real programs and real programmers about what works and how well it works and what methods do we use to determine that? I am positive that some of the results in that book are wrong, but I'm positive that many of the things I believe about physics are also wrong. This is what our best guesses are based on evidence. That's how science works, right? So let's keep going. I got a laugh from this line yesterday. Right? Machine learning is money laundering for bias. Right? We're gonna take all of the historical data on where people like to live and feed it into our algorithm, which, predict, which tells people where they ought to go and look for rental properties. Guess what? We're just repeating the segregation of yesteryear. Oh, but it's not my fault, it's just an algorithm. Right? Bias isn't part of the discussion of machine learning algorithms. Go and take a look at the standard textbooks. Go and look for the discussion of how we are just reinforcing all of the inequities of past years while absolving ourselves of sin. It's not my fault, man. I didn't shoot the guy. I just made the gun, loaded it, and handed it to the man who did fire. Right? Similarly, go and find any discussion in any of the standard books on online systems and distributed systems about harassment. Right? We, we have managed to weaponize the internet we have managed to turn it into a singularly effective vehicle for hate. And we've done that in less than a decade. And then we're pretending it's not our fault. It's not part of the standard curriculum. It isn't discussed. So, I think these all have the same root cause. 
Empathy isn't a course. How many of you did Empathy 101 as undergrads? No? Me neither. So, what's the pattern? I think the real pattern here is that there's a one-way flow of information. There's this notion, consciously or subconsciously, that we the programmers are gonna tell the rest of society what we know and they are going to be grateful. Here, here's JavaScript, you're welcome. The notion that maybe they've got things to tell us and we ought to listen is singularly absent from Silicon Valley and all of the would-be Silicon Valleys. What do we have to learn from the rest of the world about how to teach and how to learn? Oh, well, that's irrelevant, we've got MOOCs. We are going to build teaching platforms that take bad practices from the 1950s but turn them up to 11 and deliver them at light speed, okay? So, we will talk and they will listen. So I've got a couple of proposals for fixing this and then I'm gonna ask you for your help because you don't get out of this room without being asked for help. Step number one, I want an undergrad course taught at every university on software engineering that actually gets students to analyze real data. Partly, I want students to know how development actually works, not the myths and lies that we tell ourselves, not the ones in the textbooks, and not the stuff coming out of the agile crowd, which is also folklore, which is also largely unsubstantiated. It doesn't mean it's wrong, we just don't know. So, we can capitalize on the current craze for data science because as soon as you say data science in a course title, the answer is yes. Now, what's, what are you actually teaching? So let's do this. I want this to be a question that every third year computer science student knows how to tackle. Take a moment and read it. Here's the repos for six projects. Tell me if long functions or methods are likely to bu be buggier than short ones. You've got to learn how to use some tools, code analysis tools, for example. You've got to build a model. What do we mean by longer? What do we mean by buggier? How do we track back from a bug report or a bug fix back to the method? You all know that a pull request can affect multiple pieces of code. So now you have to operationalize all the things you've been arguing about, which means I can tell what you actually mean. You've also got to learn some statistics and the experimental method. And what we know from the history of other fields medicine most recently, is that once people have to do science, they will value science. Once they value it, they will engage, and you get a virtuous circle, and the standard of debate goes up. Arguments over drugs and surgery are no longer, well, they do it at Harvard. It's, show me your data. We'd be a lot better off if people in our field responded to new claims about tools and methods by saying, great, show me the study, show me the evidence. And I hope that that habit of mind would then affect other walks of life, okay? Here's proposal number two. 20% of people who completed bachelor's degree in mathematics go on to be math teachers. So there are lots and lots of programs out there that teach you how to teach math. You learn math. You learn university level math, but you also learn how to teach it. There are no such programs in Canada for teaching CS. There's only a couple in the States. What I want is more of those. I want teaching computer science, teaching programming to be a path through university in the same way that learning some CS and some economics and going off to do you know, quantitative financial systems, otherwise known as weaponized neoliberal economics, is something that you can do. This will give our schools the teachers that they need, which will in turn give us the undergrad students that we want. Problem is who's gonna teach these teachers? How do you set these programs up? Well, the first step is, I want a single course. I want universities to have one course at the third or fourth year undergrad level, which is how do you teach computing? Because we actually do know a lot. And if you're looking for references, Ambrose et al., How Learning Works, seven chapters, 300 pages, a brilliant summary from 2010 of what we actually know. If you're gonna dive into it, that's where you start. Lemov's Teach Like a Champion. What can we learn from watching 20,000 hours of teachers in classrooms about good teaching practices. And just this past summer, Mark Guzdial, who leads what I think is the best computing education research group on the planet, right, took together some of his thoughts in Learner Center Design of Computing Education, and the headset's about to fall off. There's dozens of papers. Yes, the students will be doing science in this course as well. So it'll be intellectually defensible. It's something that we can get into the curriculum that other faculty will accept as legitimate because that's part of the struggle here as well. So what's the real goal of all of this? Female participation in computer science. You've all seen this curve or something like it, okay? I don't believe we can fix this, but I think we can raise up a generation that will, okay? We're not going to be able to fix 
the problem we have with the people who created that problem. What we can do is seed the next generation and wait a decade. So, how do we teach empathy? Well, all of this is really a way to smuggle that into the curriculum. Because if we're gonna teach education, let's include Margolis and Fisher's book, Unlocking the Clubhouse. Slim little book which looked at all the reasons why women either don't go into computing or drop out at a higher rate. And acting on that six-year program, Carnegie Mellon was able to take female completion in the computer science program just in six years from 12% to 38%. Okay? Uh, Jane Margolis then went off to Los Angeles and did Stuck in the Shallow End. Let's take a look at why African Americans, Hispanic Americans are much less likely to go into computing. Let's look at the institutionalized forces that are keeping them out and how do we fix that. We can smuggle this stuff into the curriculum in the guise of teaching people about teaching. Because I know from bitter personal experience that if you show up at the average computer science department and say this stuff matters, the answer is, but that's not computer science. My response to which is computer science is whatever we decide it is. And I think this ought to be part of it. Uh, Bruce Schneier, how many of you have read Data and Goliath? Okay, privacy turns out to be a big thing. How many of you have started caring a little bit more about encryption since the election? Okay, were you taught those skills as undergrads? Were you taught to put them front and center in the systems you design? Huh, don't you wish you had? Uh, Jong, The Internet of Garbage, about Sarah Jong's book about um, online harassment. This book, The Imposter's Handbook, just came out. A self-taught programmer, who I believe is now a perfectly good developer, saying, here's all the stuff I didn't learn as an undergrad in computer science. Here's P equals NP, algorithmic complexity, red, black trees. There's nothing in there about equity. There's nothing in there about discrimination. There's nothing in there about harassment. There's nothing in there about how the stuff we make is actually used. So, here's the kind of exercise I want. And uh, some of you, I think there's at least two people in the audience, were in the class where I gave this as an exercise. You see, the bulletin boards in most computer science departments, the undergrad boards, sooner or later, sometime every fall, somebody's gonna say, gosh, why aren't there more girls in our classes? And somebody else will say, well, studies have shown that they're just less, they have less aptitude for mathematics. Okay, read this one. And I would really like it if everybody getting a bachelor's degree in computer science had had to work through this before they got their diploma. And I realize it would make a lot of people uncomfortable. That's the point. I wrote this talk before the election and like many of you, I felt nauseous Wednesday morning. I felt a sense of dread. Uh, I felt a, a great deal of fear for some of my friends. And I now feel a sudden sense of urgency. Getting a university course built, that takes a while. We've shown that the crowdsourcing model, getting people to contribute a chapter for these books and then we get a professional editor in, we get the thing out, that works. It works really well and it's a lot of fun. It's at least as much fun as contributing to an open source software project. So volume five in this series is provisionally titled, What Everyone in Tech Absolutely Positively Must Know About Racism, Sexism, Homophobia, Poverty, Harassment, Privacy, and How Our Political, Economic, and Legal Systems Actually Work, will come up with something shorter. <laughs> and I want you to contribute. There are people in this room who contributed to the architecture of open source applications. Looking back, am I allowed to swear? None of that shit mattered, not really. Okay, this one will matter. So if you want to help us do something that will matter, what I need is 5,000 words. We will help you edit it, you will have a book on the shelf that you helped write, and we will have something we could give to my 20-year-old self who didn't know any of this stuff and didn't see that there was anything particularly needing fixing will now have one place that person can go to at least find out what the other viewpoints are. I think it will be fun, and as I said, I think it has suddenly become a little bit more important to do. It's my dad, passed away about a year ago. 
one of the reasons we do things is because they're fun. The other is we've got to remember we're just passing through because that's my daughter. And she is going to ask me one day, why didn't you fix this? I would like you to help me construct an answer. Thank you. If you have any questions, there's a microphone at the front. Please come on down and ask Greg. I'll ask a question then. Um, has anybody sent you chapters yet, or is this the first place you're announcing it? I have a long tradition of publicly announcing these things at PyCon. Uh, I have spoken to a few people. I'm not going to start tagging things until about a month from now. Right? Everybody needs to think about what else they've got on their plate. Any other questions for Greg? Microphone on. Uh, the issue of lack of participation, especially of women in computer programming, is a pretty big one. And there are universities sort of trying to deal with these, even currently. They're not doing a particularly good job, but there are universities actually trying to deal with this. So, I mean, are you aware of any such programs and what are your criticism of those programs? Three points to that. First, I don't get to criticize, right? There are people who've devoted their entire careers to this. I can point you at a lot of discussion about this. The second is that Elizabeth Petitsis, who is here in Toronto, has a hypothesis that explains the shape of that red curve. You see, here's what happens. We get these periodic booms in computing, right? I've, I've lived through three, right? Where it suddenly becomes the hot topic and universities are overwhelmed by applications to their CS programs. So what do they do? They raise the entrance standards. You need to have higher grades coming in. And what we think we've seen in the late 90s and again right now is that when you do that, you undo a lot of the good work towards making computer science more inclusive. You go back to selecting for geeky white and Asian males who spent a lot of their teenage years in their basements. Right? So we do some work and then we undo some of it because, wow, this has suddenly become so popular that we have to put more barriers in place or we're going to be overwhelmed. All right. That's provisional. Elizabeth is still working on this, work, this research here in Toronto. Um, but it does seem to explain why we keep pushing and the rock keeps not rolling up the hill. There's a lot of other interesting research. And what I just told you might be wrong. But let's come back to this notion of we can do science around this. We've got data we can go and study. And there are people in this room who are better able than I am to judge these programs and to point at good examples. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. I'd love to see this, this kind of stuff in our high schools and our universities. One of the biggest challenges with things like this is competing for a limited amount of time and attention. I'm just curious, what do you think is probably going to get knocked out for this? I'm saying it absolutely deserves a place there. I'm just curious, like, what's probably going to have to go? Yeah, the, the biggest problem is that the curriculum is already full, right? I, I don't know how many of you know, but Toronto District School Board wanted to bring programming into every high school in Toronto, which is the largest school board district in Canada several years ago, and things have been deadlocked since because nobody can agree on what to cut to free up the resources. There was a serious proposal to cut high school math in order to make room for programming. As a programmer, I think that's a crazy idea. Right? But something has to give. Um, at, certainly at the undergraduate level, I think we could use maybe one less numerical methods course. Right? I mean, I, there are things we could cut. Right? The good news is that some of the larger universities in Canada now have tenured lecturers who teach full time and are in a position to actually implement this. Right? So I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful. Hi, uh, just a quick question about like the, um, like I know that we have a problem when it comes to like uh, gender balance in computer science, but I'm wondering is this like, has anyone actually done any uh, studies on seeing if this is more than just an English speaking North American problem? Yes it is. The only jurisdiction in which there's anything like gender parity in computing are the Gulf states and Malaysia. 
And the reason is that computing is something that women can do as a business from home in conservative Muslim families. Not even with like uh, um, Eastern and Central European countries? No. Not even close. Um, A good friend of mine is Polish, and however bad you think it is in North America, right? uh, Growing up in Poland with a male-dominated heavy engineering culture, yeah, there's a long time like. Thank you. Cheers. Sorry, folks, this will be the last question and then we have to wrap up. Settle? Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Round of applause for Greg, please. <laughs>